Awesome. Well, welcome everyone to the Volunteer Management 101 Express webinar. Um, today we're very lucky to have Glenda Martin from Volunteer in Canterbury um, hosting this session. And to give you a bit of a bit of an insight on what's going to be coming into the session, uh, we'll cover the fundamentals of volunteer management, including recruitment, retention, and recognition. Um, and we'll also touch on the trends of volunteering, for example, what the younger volunteers coming through expect um, from their experience. If you have any questions throughout the session today, we do have a Q&A box just in the bottom center of your screen. Please put, through, uh, put those questions through in there. Um, and Glenda will look at answering as many of those questions as she can at the end of the session. Like I said before, we are recording, so if you do know anyone who would like to uh, view this session, um, who would benefit from viewing this session, you can share that out with them after this. Or if you do have to pop out a little bit early, that's fine, because you'll be able to catch up and re-watch going forward. I would now like to pass over to Glenda, who will have um, the chance to take over this session. Hello everybody and welcome. Uh, it's great to be able to do this, particularly during National Volunteer Week, um, because I'm sure that everyone's taking the opportunity, and if you haven't already done so, you've still got one more day, uh, to thank the volunteers that are working for your organisations. So this is a bit of an express um, journey through volunteer management basics, recruitment, retention, recognition, and if there seems to be more emphasis on recruitment, that's because if we're getting our volunteers interested in joining our volunteer teams uh, and we do it right, uh, that enhances our ability to retain them. And then if we recognise them, them the way they want to, um, that'll further uh, retain them with our teams. So I'm just going to go into share screen now so you don't have to look at me. Uh, and as Michael said, questions and answers, there's a box there. Uh, put those in. If we don't have time at the end, uh, we'll be sending out a few resources and links uh, and answering those questions uh, via email afterwards. So I'm just going to share my screen and we'll get going. So, recruitment, retention, recognition. That's what we're talking about. We do need, though, to have a context for any discussion that we have, a bit of a perspective. And the perspective that I want to set from the beginning is the size of the volunteer contribution to New Zealand. New Zealanders give more than 159 million unpaid hours to their communities. It's about the equivalent of 133,000 full-time jobs. The generosity of New Zealanders is well known and it ranks high globally. That's in gift in time and in gift in dollars. But our population is a team of 5 million people. And those 5 million people are spread over a relatively large geographical area. COVID-19 has shown us that we work very well as a team, but it is actually a limited pool. And it's from that source of 5 million across that geographical spread that we all source members for our volunteer teams. Well, over the next hour, we'll be looking, I'll be talking mainly about what we consider formal volunteering with community organisations. Alongside that, informal volunteering is alive and well in New Zealand. One in two New Zealanders volunteer for an organisation or help a person from another household, checking in on neighbours, helping out at the local marae, faith-based volunteering, or even local schools. So volunteering is a gift of someone's time. If you're not being paid, that is still volunteering. Equally, I really want you to recognise the importance of your volunteer team, not just to what your organisation is doing in your local community, but to the country as a whole. The volunteer contribution to New Zealand's GDP sits alongside that of the construction industry. It shouldn't be underestimated. 3.5 billion is the dollar figure that's put on it, and that's about 1.7% of New Zealand's gross domestic product. Services, services which are considered essential are often volunteer-driven. 
St. John, Civil Defence, Emergency and Fire are obvious examples. And Kiwis are passionate about their sport. Whether it's rugby, cricket, basketball, cycling, snowport sports, everything in between, globally Kiwi athletes reach high standards of excellence. And what's sometimes not acknowledged is that most of those athletes will have gained their knowledge and passion by coming through a sporting system which at its grassroots is essentially volunteer driven. So remember, if there's so much going on in our community, people are busy. And they're going to want to make choices how they spend their time. It's approximately 114,000 not-for-profit institutions in New Zealand. In 2013, 10% of the people involved in those institutions were paid, which leaves 90% as volunteers. Figures are staggering. They mean that we must not and cannot be complacent about our volunteer management. We need to get it right. So who does volunteer? Volunteering makes people feel engaged and involved in their communities. For that reason, it has to be inclusive. Does your volunteer team reflect the community that it serves? The demographics here in Canterbury have changed significantly over the past several years, and those from outside this region might want to have, have a reflect on whether your demographics are, have similarly changed. Newcomers to our region may not come from communities where that lend a hand normalness of volunteering is prevalent, but they do want to communicate and engage and contribute to their new communities. There are benefits for them for that. They get an insight into the Kiwi workplace etiquette and there's an opportunity to meet new people. But if volunteering is a new concept to them, they may need to be asked. They may not put their hand up, but if you tap them on the shoulder, they will be grateful to have been asked. There's another group of New Zealanders who often get overlooked. Over 20% of New Zealanders identify as having a disability. Some of those people find it challenging to get paid work despite their personal, technical and academic skills. A volunteer opportunity may be a stepping stone for them as they build their CV. Consider how accessible your organisation is to this group of people. The building of CVs is increasingly important role of volunteering for many people. Your organisations need to realise that and build that into your recruitment where you can. Without the low-skilled after-school type roles that there have been in the past, there's a real desire for some practical experience for those preparing to join the workforce. And also for those preparing to return to the work workforce after a break. Employers look for volunteering or some form of community engagement on CVs. It indicates an interest in the community and very likely some great life skills that will have been picked up through volunteering, which simply can't be taught in a classroom. Mm. Providing a volunteer experience that meets these needs will benefit your organisation, but it may only be short term because volunteers mm. aren't sticking around as long as they used to. But it will benefit the wider community long term and particularly if you make that experience a good one. And if you get your retention and your recognition of your volunteers right, even when it's time for them to move on, they will remain ambassadors for your organisations wherever they go in the future. 
that feeling engaged and involved in our communities also creates empathy. And empathy enhances the way people react and interact. For some organisations more than others, it would be critical that all team members, paid and unpaid, have empathy for the people to whom they are providing services. If your organisation is like that, you need to be creating opportunities for that to happen. Face-to-face -face meetings create empathy much more rapidly than just hearing or reading about someone's story. It will give your volunteers a better understanding of their role and how important it is. It will validate their decision to give their time to your organisation. That increases buy-in and that aids in retention. Volunteers have a choice where to give their time. And their available time to gift is research telling us becoming less. Today's lifestyle sees two-income families and older adults who are often choosing to stay in paid work if they have that opportunity available to them. Or they could be moving into support roles for their children's children. They simply don't have the time on their hands as much as they used to. The older age group remains the largest group of volunteers in New Zealand. But there's been a lot of change over the last decade in particular in how some of our older adults are living. Many are choosing the option of a retirement village setting where there are new opportunities and activities within that new community. That may mean that they simply don't have time for some of the things, including volunteering, which they may have been involved in previously. Don't forget also that the majority of those will have a ceiling of income, which cannot be expanded. It's important that those older volunteers, all volunteers, but particularly those older volunteers, are looked out for in terms of any financial reimbursement mm. that is available to them for travel, parking, and so on. The implications of this whole new way of living, particularly around the retirement village, isn't something that's clear yet. Um, and together with projections of less home ownership by our older adults, over the next few years, there may be quite an impact on that size of group of the older adults who are available to volunteer. So why will people volunteer for your organisation? When we ask this question, the answer is usually a list of awesome work that an organisation is doing. And I don't for a minute doubt that. But in roles that I'm, people like me are privileged to have, we meet a lot of organisations doing a lot of awesome work. And all volunteers' roles are important. All the services being provided in the community are filling a need. A lot of them started out as a need and have grown since then. So volunteers is a wide choice available to them of where they're going to give their time. Why would they choose your organisation? When you're recruiting, one of the things that volunteers tell us is that they like good procedures. But how do volunteers get to choose your organisation over another? Because initially they don't know even what your procedures are. What's your story? Community newspapers and social media are excellent places to be telling your story. How do you do that? How do you do it currently? And what should the story that you're telling be about? Every organisation has different aspects to it. Many started 
as an idea and develop to take action and get results. Many have had setbacks and perhaps had to change the way they've dealt with things. Volunteers will be drawn to different parts of that story. So consider, first of all, being very clear what your organisation's story is and then breaking it down. Stories don't need to be told in any particular order. Tell the story that's needed at the time. For recruitment, it might be sharing stories of other volunteers and their words telling why they joined your organisation and what they actually do. Once volunteers are on board, it might be the celebration stories which keep them enthusiastic about continuing with your organisation or the vision story, so that everyone understands the direction you're heading in. The legacy story. This slide has the, the stories broken down to an origin story, a vision story, a taken action story, overcoming obstacles stories, uh, and celebration stories. The people like us story is the one that works really well and volunteering Canterbury's experience via social media. One of the reasons is that the people we talk about like to share their story with their own communities. So you, you just enhance the whole number of people who are finding about your organisation. The other thing to think about is what the role is, what the skills re are required, the sort of commitment you're looking for. Who's doing that role now? A volunteer role should not replace a paid role. What skills are required? Can you offer training for volunteers or do you need to recruit people skill ready? What time commitment do you need? Two to three hours a week or a fortnight? Can you split the role? to make it two shorter stints by two different volunteers. Looking for more hours than two to three hours a week or a fortnight will limit the number of people in the pool that you have available. Limiting your choice in the volunteer market, if you like. How long do you wish people to stay with your organisation for? With inductions, getting to know the way things are run, value for time, money invested in getting volunteers up to speed, you will inevitably hope for a long-term commitment. That trend, however, is not what we're seeing. Volunteers are not looking to make long-term commitments. The world is an uncertain place. In Canterbury, we saw that possibly more dramatically than other areas after the earthquakes in 2010, 2011. And we will see it all again across the nation post COVID, particularly with some volunteers will be people who are long-term looking for paid employment. They will not want to commit to a long-term unpaid role. Our younger people, our 18 to 25 year olds, want short and sharp project-based volunteer opportunities. These volunteers are looking for a finite project, a beginning date and an end date. As I said earlier, our older adults are the largest group volunteering in New Zealand, but our younger volunteers are coming through and globally, 18 to 25 years, have had the most growth in recent years. If you want to utilise that growth and the people with greater accessibility, 18 to 25 year olds, you need to look at your roles and you need to make them shorter or seem shorter. If you have a number of young people on board for a project, Find a sponsor or prepare a budget for food during that specific volunteer period. 
don't expect them to come back for a separate thank you event. They're busy. They have social lives and cell phones and places to be, but they will welcome being fed while they work. You can create a social environment while they volunteer, which is a win-win for everyone. Of course, that might mean that your organisation, bearing in mind we're going to be needing to induct more volunteers who are staying shorter times, you might need to streamline your system so that they're workable for that purpose. Think about putting a timeline of, say, three months for a role while you hope that people will stay longer. And in that first three months, strengthen their buy-in to your organisation so that they want to stay longer. For many of us, and in particular our younger volunteers, think about what your organisation does and why. Think about the impact it has. If you're unclear, except for very locally what your impact is, check out Dr. Goebel, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and identify where your organisation fits globally in making the world a better place. That impact is what you want to talk about, particularly to your younger volunteers. Remind them that without your input, you could not do X, Y, and Z in your local community. Make them feel valued and make them feel like they're part of something bigger than your volunteer team, your community, and even our country. We know that this is already working with volunteers. If they understand, and particularly our younger volunteers, our employers tell us that young graduates are going to them asking what the salary is, what the holidays are, and what community involvement this firm has at job interviews. So click into that. If you're struggling to keep volunteers for longer than three months, consider when advertising roles offering something along the lines of written reference available after three months. We know that this is of use to our young volunteers. We know it will be of use to our people looking for work, uh, but engaging in volunteer work in the interim, having lost a role due to COVID. While maintaining community engagement, learning new skills or giving back new skills, build up a rapport with them so that when they do move on, they still retain a valuable relationship with you. That may be as a donor, or it may be simply when it's going around the office and the new role saying, let's do something in the community, they'll put their hand up and suggest your organisation. Volunteers these days will simply not stay forever. Increasingly, we don't stay in the same career, paid career. Why would we do it in our volunteer roles? If you have a strong buy-in, they will stay longer if they can, and they might help out later. But at the very least, as they walk through the door to their next adventure, they're going to be an ambassador for your organisation. Procedures I touched on earlier, because that's feedback that we get from some of our volunteers, that our organisations aren't quite doing it right. Look at your steps of recruitment. How long does it take your team to get back to a volunteer after they first contact you to inquire about joining your team? We recommend aiming for 24 hours. 48 hours would be the max. We know that when someone makes a decision to volunteer and then finds a role they're interested in, they've already hopped in. They've already partially committed they are ready to start. And if you get back to them in a timely manner, you'll get them a lot easier than if you leave it because 
they will go and find another role which they can get a quicker response time from. Or they may not bother to volunteer at all. So make it easy for them. Roles which require police checks before they can be begun mean that you need to keep the volunteer engaged while you and they wait. This can be incredibly frustrating. There's a real risk that the volunteer won't wait. Think of ways to keep the person engaged while you're all waiting. Inductions, if they can be done uh, before the police check comes through. Can the volunteer be paired with an existing volunteer in the interim? Are there meetings they can attend to observe? Training they can be getting until they get it? At the very least, the communication lines open. And if right now you're starting to think about your processes, perhaps ask the question, when did my organisation last evaluate its volunteer program. Two thirds of organisations don't regularly evaluate their volunteer programs. Now is as good a time as any to do that. Where are you recruiting and is it working? Word of mouth is always good. So consider functions where volunteers might bring a friend along to see what your organisation does. Find a spokesperson that could be a new volunteer role. It could be an excellent volunteer role for someone who's now going back into the workforce but who would like to talk to groups in the evenings perhaps about your organisation. Seek out your local volunteer centre. There are 17 volunteer centres around the country and they will all assist with recruitment. At Volunteer in Canterbury, we have a website which attracts about 300 new registrations per month from people wanting to find out about volunteering. So there's a, a heap of interest out there. If your role isn't on those databases, it simply can't be considered. All volunteer centres will also have other networks which they utilise for recruitment. Here at Volunteering Canterbury, we partner uh, with the universities in our area, Lincoln and the University of Canterbury, as well as hooking into their own recruitment systems. We offer volunteer expos once a year which are always well attended and our organisations always have a lot of follow-up homework from the interests that they receive. Most volunteer centres also have some connections for some sort of community notice boards or advertising. Another way to introduce a new set of people to your organisation is to utilise different volunteers for those one-off projects. Don't burn out your core volunteer team with over and above tasks that need to be undertaken. Again, contact your local volunteer centre. Last year, Volcan's group volunteering project gifted about 3,000 hours to the community for those sorts of one-off projects. Groups from businesses, faith-based, special interest groups, students, they're an excellent way to spread the word of what your organisation is doing and perhaps pick up some new volunteers to join your core team. An interview. An interview is an important opportunity to give information about your organisation as well as about the specific role which the volunteer is interested in. Some of you will be doing it by phone and some of you will be inviting potential volunteers into your offices. It doesn't actually matter how you do it, when you volunteer, you interview potential volunteers, you need to give your volunteers a little bit of history and a little bit of a sense of direction of where you, your organisation is going. Ask the volunteer questions, and one of the most important I suggest is, why do you want to volunteer for this organisation? Be professional. Remember, a lot of volunteers are using volunteering as a practice run to get some experience, build their CV to get into a paid role. I believe it's incumbent on our organisations to be providing an experience that is useful for the volunteer's purpose. If you're asking for personal data, be aware that under privacy legislation, 
you should only be asking for information that you need for a particular purpose. And if you need guidance along that, uh, there are resources on Volcan's website, uh, there'll be resources on Volunteer in Auckland's uh, website, Volunteer in New Zealand, or make a connection with your local community law team. The interview is the time to talk about impact and the importance of the volunteer team in making that impact. That's the time to talk about rights and responsibilities. So while your volunteer has rights, they also have responsibilities because if you're not paying them, they do need to turn up. They need to be very well assured that by their turning up and being part of your team, you're able to roll out the services. And if they can't make it, they need to let you know why they can't make it. It's a two-way street. Everyone's motivated by something, and in that first interview with the volunteer, you will have asked, why do you want to volunteer for this organisation? And you'll have received a wide range of responses. The summit will be giving back. The summit will be because they've heard about the organisation, what it does, and it fits with their values, and they want to be involved. For some, it will be they want to get out of the house, they want to meet new people. They want to pick up new skills. You need that information at the recruitment stage. Organisations should also have volunteer agreements. We would recommend a review period in that agreement. And that's a time to check three months perhaps down the track that the reason for joining the organisation hasn't changed and that they're happy and that you're happy. If you know there's an issue, you may be able to tweak the role and keep the volunteer. The interview should be a one-to-one -one chance to catch up with each volunteer because not everyone is comfortable to share in a group. Why do you think people volunteer for your organisation? You should know why people volunteer for your organisation. If it's because they thought it was a friendly team and there was lots of social activities, now is not the time to stop those activities. If it's because you're off on training, first aid certificates or something like that, make sure that training goes ahead for that volunteer that identified as being important for them. At the interview, you're going to talk rights and responsibilities. That volunteer agreement is a great place to insert a one-sheeter about rights and responsibilities. I've seen some incredibly long volunteer agreements. Uh, it can be one page and then tucked behind that. So the same volunteer agreement for every member of your team, but tucked behind that an individual role description, your health and safety policy, uh, and rights and responsibilities, any other interest and things that you might want to share, a bit of an induction pack, uh, but that volunteer agreement itself need only be one page. The volunteer needs to know who to go to if they've got a problem, who to report those health and safety issues, workplace hazards and suggestions. The other thing that a lot of organisations aren't doing and so they're missing an opportunity, in, in my opinion, to get information that's of value to developing their volunteer team, is the exit interview. You need to know why your volunteers are leaving. It may be unrelated to their volunteer role, and it may be directly related to their volunteer role. If one volunteer is leaving because of some perceived lack of support by your organisation, Chances are that it's another member or two that are also having the same thought. And don't forget, there's 114,000 community organisations relying on volunteers. Loads of volunteer roles available. Make your volunteer organisation the obvious choice. Another question to ask yourself is, does my organisation offer an induction programme for volunteers? 
a third of the organisations around the country do not offer an induction program. So if you're one of that third, it would be timely to have a think about what that looks like for your organisation. Regular reviews, checking that the organisation is providing the desired volunteer experience and where it might improve that, that's how you retain your volunteers. If you've met, if you've seen them displaying great leadership, you might want to consider there, there might be another role where they could utilise that role. Don't assume that they will want to utilise that role. It doesn't necessarily mean because they're doing a great job as in one role that they want, for example, to be on your organisation's board. They might be quite happy doing what they're doing. But give them the opportunity, uh, but don't make it an expectation. Volunteering it's, should be a worthwhile experience. When your volunteers get home, they should feel good about what they've been doing. On the day they're a volunteer, they should look forward to it. It shouldn't be a chore. Knowing what makes it a feel-good experience for your volunteer would have been indicated if you asked the right questions at your recruitment interview. But it could have changed. Has your volunteer's availability changed, for example? Check at a review and stay on track. And so, my fellow not-for-profits, Ask not what your volunteers can do for you, but what you can do for your volunteers. The day of what volunteers can do for my organisation are gone. You know volunteers are essential to your organisation's ability to offer services in the community. But ask, what are the volunteers giving back for their time? They don't want paid. They're happy to give their time. But there must be a motivation call it a need that they want it filled. And if you don't fill it, they'll look for an organisation that will. If you're looking for a simple way to figure out where the members in your team fit, I personally think McClellan's motivational needs is basic, been around a long time, but it's simple and it seems to work. The three types of motivational needs can be relatively easily met. If there's a need for power, find an opportunity where the volunteer can take control of a project, for example, or a team. Uh, they might want a title for their role. Uh, volunteers who have a need for achievement, like might to take training, definitely be, be like being recognised for what they do. Mention in a newsletter, at a social gathering, at an awards event. In your local community, there'll be awards offered. Um, here in Christchurch, our city council has local boards that do awards. Uh, we do our own volunteer recognition awards where nominations are welcome from community groups for outstanding volunteer contributions. Volunteers who are motivated by need for affiliation want to feel part of a team. Um, so if, for example, you've got only a small number of volunteers on site at anywhere time, but there's one time, but there's a larger team, I think about things, and I've seen some great examples, for example, of a, a, a tree, a volunteer tree, where there's a picture of uh, every volunteer on the tree. So even if only two or three volunteers are in the office at the same time, they realise that they're part of a much bigger group. Ensure that the volunteers have good information about your impact, um, because those people who ha have a need for affiliation probably belong to lots of other groups uh, and so can be sharing your organisation's good deeds uh, with others and perhaps uh, drawing in a few more volunteers. They'll enjoy the social aspect so they'll need there will be a real need for that sort of socialiser. They'll look forward to events organised through the year where people get together. Uh, don't expect your people who have a need for power to, to be it that, that they will have had their needs met through something else. So we've got our one volunteer, but they do have two roles, that role that is on their role description and that ambassador role. The volunteer who doesn't feel that, like they're well treated 
will share that. Uh, and often they'll share that more loudly than the volunteer who feels good about how they've been treated. Every volunteer in your team has a different community outside your organisation. So if you want to really get that ambassador role, they're going to be ambassadors to a certain extent anyway. Uh, so I would argue that we make them the best informed ambassador that they can be. And that's perhaps a social uh, media Facebook group just for your volunteers, a newsletter that goes just to your volunteers, keeping the information flying. Um, some volunteers can feel quite put out, particularly if they've been with an organisation for a long time, to read in a local paper something that the organisation's doing that they didn't know about. Um, so it put on a human resources management hat uh, we know that all our volunteer coordinators and managers come from with very different experiences in life and not always having a, a human resource management experience, but volunteer centres are the places to go for some help. There's a lot of training on offer um, and, and, try and try and get it right. Your obligation to your unpaid staff in the workplace is in most cases the same as that as if staff are paid. Volunteer uh, workplace legislation has had so many changes in the past couple of years and there's no sign of that stopping anywhere soon. So keep an eye out for training around that sort of thing, just so that you know that you're doing the right thing by your volunteers. Who is your organisation? What does your organisation do? Why do you do it? Share that again and again in as many different ways as you can. Celebrate, celebrate achievements. Keep people excited and enthusiastic. Knowing your volunteers is going to mean you get your recognition right. So we talked about meeting needs, that's recognition in itself. If you're doing something like sending out cards on people's anniversaries for when they started with your organisation, that's absolutely fine. Think about it carefully. You must not forget anyone. You need a good system in place. You could do an annual or a quarterly social get together, but don't forget, not everyone's motivated by that affiliation. So think about a few events that appeal to different people. Training, an opportunity to hear your patrons speak. Ensure your organisation has a volunteer expenses budget to cover events or small gifts. Some funders will fund specifically for volunteer expenses. Everyone should have that in their budget. If you aren't the person who has access to putting the budget together, speak to the person who does the budget and get them on board. Depending on the size of your team, things are obviously more easily managed than some. Some organisations I know have a drawer filled with stamped envelopes and things like the little coffee sachets that you can buy in boxes and they might send a team member who'd had a particularly busy day a card and a sachet of coffee with a note on it saying thanks a latte. People love that sort of thing. They feel special, they feel like an individual and they feel like they know that you know them as a person. And always, always, um, the most important thing to do is say thank you. That sounds really simple, but people are busy. I would suggest that the last words that your volunteers hear as they go out the door after each shift is thank you. Um, and it's really easy not to do that. You can contact, um, as I say, myself for uh, more information and also other volunteer centres will have web pages uh, and we can have a look and see if there's any questions now. Um, the volunteer agreements one is, a, is an interesting one. We've had a couple of sessions on that recently with community law, so there's some good resources around the sort of things that should be included. And that we use the word agreement rather than contract 
Uh, if you've got a volunteer contract in place, that's absolutely fine, but you might want to pop in to those resources and just see the sort of comments that community law had to make about some of the terminology that we use when we talk to our volunteers. Michael. That was awesome. Thank you so much for that, Glenn. That was great to hear from you. And there's a lot of gems hidden in there as well. So I definitely think we have to go over that and there's a couple of things that we could look at too going forward. Um, I'd like to open up this opportunity now for people, if they do have any questions, to fire them through the Q&A box. Uh, we have run slightly ahead of schedule, which is awesome. Um, so yeah, if you do have any questions, pop them through now and Glenda will be able to have a look at that while we're all on here and all live. If there are questions you'd like to ask further down the track as well, Glenda and I will send out a follow-up from this. Um, that will have the video, uh, potentially some notes from the session as well, um, and Glenda's contact details. So if you do need some support going forward, if you have some more tips and tricks you'd like to get from Glenda or even support from volunteering Canterbury itself, um, we can do so. One of the questions we've got is, love the thanks a latte. Any other ideas, Glenda? Okay, so on our resource page, and I haven't got a copy of it printed out, but I will, I will, um, I will find the resource. Uh, we had a session where we had a, a, one of our volunteers came in and had this amazing array of little gifts that she put together. So little chocolates saying, um, thanks for being sweet and bits and pieces like that. I personally am not, good at thinking about things like that but some people are brilliant so I will dig out that resource and I'll, I'll add it uh, send it through to Michael to send around with the link. Awesome so there's no other question that popped through the Q&A box so if you do have any further questions going forward we will send out Glenda's contact details and you can get in touch with her there but other than that I just want to say thank you very much Glenda for presenting today it was amazing to hear from you and I definitely think we'll be keen to hear from you. You're welcome. Looking forward. Um, I'm going to wrap up the recording now and we'll definitely be in touch very soon. Thanks, guys.